We are in a series right now discussing in between times. And the essence of this sermon series is about how to make the most of our time while we're all pressing towards different goals and ambitions that are out in the future. All of us, uh, some, some of us even here now, maybe are having a hard time focusing on the service because we're trying to achieve something, we're trying to accomplish something. And one of the dangers that we can all run into is in trying to accomplish something out in the future, we forget to enjoy and make the most of the present. And we uh, sometimes can use and objectify the people around us instead of learning to enjoy the people around us because we're so focused on certain goals and ambitions that we can end up using the people to reach those goals rather than enjoying the people and the process that God has us in trying to achieve those things. And in doing so, we will end up not living for God's glory, but for our own. And so this series is really a reminder to enjoy the journey, enjoy the process. We might not achieve those goals and ambitions that we set out for, but we can achieve honoring God on a daily basis and enjoying the journey with him and enjoying the journey with the people that he's given us uh, to serve one another, to love one another. And in the end, that is where fulfillment comes, whether we reach the goal or not. And what I've been trying to call us to is learning from others who have put ambition and goals ahead of God in people and have achieved those things and found them empty. That they've given themselves fully as a living sacrifice to achieving what they thought would bring fulfillment and happiness. And they get there and they achieve it and they find, ah, oh, it's not all that I thought it would be. And so this is a reminder that it's only in living for the glory of God in reflecting his goodness that we can enjoy every single day, see the significance in every single day, and make the most of in-between times. And, and lately, you've, uh, if you've been a part of our church, you've seen a lot of people have unfortunately uh, gone on to be with the Lord, some unexpectedly. And it's a sobering reminder as well that we never know the time that's going to come for us to take our last breath. And we don't want to get so focused on certain outcomes that we forget that, you know what? Today might be the last day. And how do I want to make the most of this day before I stand before God and give an accounting? I don't know about you. I want to make sure that every single day counts with God by first focusing every day on him and how he wants me to reflect him to the people around me in this journey towards the promised land. Today we're going to read from Philippians chapter 2, uh, starting in verses 5 through 11 and then jumping ahead in a text that really gets us to the heart of the purpose and meaning of life that God has for us and how to make the most of the time that he's given us while pressing into the next thing we're trying to achieve. And this is what it says. You can read along in the overhead. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. In other words, he didn't use his power and authority against us while we were his enemies. Rather, he used in his authority and a power to serve us, to make a way for us to be reconciled to God when he could have easily banished us altogether. He, in fact, made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. In other words, Jesus chose the cross, and he didn't have to. Nobody forced him to. He gave himself over to the cross for us. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Some conclusions then, going on to verse 14. Do everything, this is a tough one, do everything without grumbling 
or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation who grumbles and argues about everything. (laughs) Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky. You will stand out for the glory of God when you humbly take on his mindset to acknowledge him as Lord and be a humble servant, realizing that the only one who is deserving of honor took on our humility that we might be set free. Listen to what he then goes on to say about Timothy and the goal that we should all have if we want to bring glory to God and love Jesus. He says, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon. I have no one else like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare. For everyone looks out for their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. Wouldn't it be great if God could say of you, oh, I am so thrilled with that person. I, they genuinely have my interest in mind, and my interest is other people that I died for. And man, I can trust anybody with you because I know you genuinely are going to do whatever you can to show them the love of Christ with your actions and your words. Well, there are three questions I want to answer out of this text today that I pray inspire us regarding how to make the most of our time every day in light of this passage. First question, why would Jesus make himself a servant at cost to himself? Why would he do that? Second question I want to answer today, why should we follow then in his example? What is the end result? So first question, why would Jesus make himself into a servant, being God, taking on human form, willingly going to a humiliating, excruciating death on a cross? You know, to help us contemplate this, I want to use an illustration Um, from corporate America, and and I can't ever do justice to this passage. But I want us to go back to the uh, word meaning of corporation. Corporation comes from the Latin word for body, the Latin word being corpus. And so we understand that in a corporation with an owner and a CEO, the people then who operate within that body with a mission statement, all trying to accomplish a goal together, a common goal together, though they are all different and unique and they bring different gifts and graces to the table, they are all one in the sense that they are trying to accomplish something, though there are many parts. They're trying to use their different parts and their different gifts to reach the same end goal. And so they are one interconnected representation of each other. So if someone then in a corporation were to defraud investors, do something horrible that gives a black eye to the whole company, the CEO then is bound together with the employee in in a way that they would often step down from their position even though they weren't the one who was defrauding others. Because that person, they were part of their organization. They were under their leadership. And so they were a reflection of them and a reflection of the corpus as a whole. And so they were all interdependent on each other with certain values. And so one person stepping out of line represents a whole organization, a whole corpus, a whole body of people. They're all negatively affected, just in the same way as if every person is under good leadership in that company, they bring a bright spot to that whole corpus. One person's positive actions, one person going above and beyond, one person's positive attitude reflects extremely well on the whole. All completely a reflection of upper management. And so while... Someone at the top might not perpetrate bad deeds. They will ultimately take responsibility for it. Well, in the biblical worldview, 
Adam was made in the image of Jesus to be the CEO over the owner's creation. He was made in the owner's image and likeness to partner with him, with Vice President Eve, if you will, in bringing order to chaos, in keeping God's good creation good, and then being fruitful in multiplying out into creation a reflection of who God is. And we were singing today, God, he is so good. And all of creation is so good. And we are so good. And God has given us the privilege to partner with him to reflect that goodness in all of our relationships, in all the way that we do business. But somewhere we decided we knew better than God. And things went bad. And we all now are suffering every time we turn on the news. And we're all interconnected more than we realize. See, you, on a smaller scale in your home, your decisions affect other people. I can't just do whatever I want and not have it affect my wife and not have it affect my children. My actions, my decisions, or lack thereof, it ultimately has a ripple-down effect on other people. And then they carry that effect into their worlds. And they have an effect in school. They have an effect with their coworkers. They have an effect with their friends, for good or for bad. We are all more interconnected than we realize based on the decisions that we make. And so the picture that God gives us of of creation is here he is. He placed a reflection of himself into creation to manage creation with him in partnership with him to share in his joy and to be fruitful and multiply and bring order and protect it and keep it. And then they gave it over to a bad slave driver. They sold the company. They sold us out. And we're all affected negatively But then the good news, God so loved the world that he came to get ownership back at cost to himself. He came to get headship over us again. And when he is Lord, everyone flourishes. When we are Lord and in control, everyone suffers. N.T. Wright says of this passage in Philippians 2, Jesus' decision to become human and go all the way to the cross was not a decision to stop being divine. Rather, he showed the reality of what it is to be divine. This is why he is worthy of praise and worship and honor and lordship. Is This is who he is. This is who God is. Completely other-centered. Completely interested in our well-being at cost to himself. He is the full revelation of who God is, the exact representation. Adam Davidson is a well-known atheist journalist from the New Yorker, connected to a lot of Hollywood, and he recently did an interview with an apologist named Sean McDowell, where he asked Sean McDowell, the Christian, whatever questions he wanted to ask about Christianity. And, And something got my attention Uh, in this podcast that I was listening to from Adam Davidson, the atheist. He said, I don't know how to think about this thing you call God. When I hear someone say God, I I just can't help but to like think of an old man in the sky with a big beard. I, I just can't even grasp the concept. I don't know how I could worship this being that you talk of. And when I heard that, I just so badly wanted to to get involved in the podcast with Adam and tell Adam the good news of how he can get a handle on who God is. And the good news is this, that Jesus has made a way to enter in and make us his temple and give us his nature of other-centered love And that if he wants to see God, he can come to the church of Jesus Christ where Jesus is Lord, his corpus, his body, and see other-centered love with no thought of self. And when he sees that, he's seeing God in action. He's seeing the goodness of God that we were talking about. This God doesn't dwell in temple made by human hands, and he tells us not to make images in his likeness because he already did, and it's us. We are the temple of God. 
made to be filled with all the fullness of God flowing out of us into other centered beings so that the world can see his goodness and know his goodness. And so I'm telling you, you have a high calling on your life. God is calling you to be his reflection. God is calling you to live for the glory of God. And so I'm telling you, every single day is significant on your journey to whatever it is that you're trying to accomplish. What makes life significant is you are made to reflect the goodness of the owner of it all, the Lord Jesus Christ, participating with him daily to show his goodness in your life. So when people say, I mean, I don't know what God wants from me. I don't know his will for my life. His will for your life is to know him, to love him, to cling to him and participate with showing his goodness to everybody around you. He came to serve you, to pour his life into you so that you could pour your life into other people. And that's where joy and fulfillment comes from, is that God wants to use you and he wants to use me despite the fact that in and of ourselves we are nothing. With him, we can make an impact and a difference in this world that can change the world. I want you to think about the first disciples of Jesus. They have everything against them. They have this cruel Roman Empire that hangs Jesus on a cross naked and humiliated as they did anybody they saw a threat to Rome. That it's just this brutal society and culture. And these guys are not the educated guys, they didn't go to seminary. They didn't know how to save the world. They didn't know how to change the world and make an impact. They only knew one thing, the, the God who overcame the grave that said the same power that is in him can get into us and the same love that is in him can get into us. And let me tell you, when the love of God is in you, you can, it can compel you to do things you would never do in and of yourself. You know, I don't need a class on evangelism and loving other people when God is having his way in me because I just got to figure it out because love makes me figure out. Think about when you, th when, as a guy, as a guy, I'm speaking to the guys for a minute. Think about when you first saw that, that woman that you, you love. And when I say love, you know, you, there was a little lust involved or whatever. You're just like, man, what a beautiful girl. You didn't have to go to necessarily all these classes and strategies to, to get proactive to figure it out. <laughs> You, you went after it, man. You were like, I'm going to fumble and I'm going to make a mess of it, but I got to get this girl. I'm going to figure this out. You see, the love of God should be compelling us, the nature of God in us. The, the root issue of every issue is a born-again experience where we need the nature of God in us, and if we don't have the nature of God in us, we can't do anything. And I just felt like repenting up here after the worship service section. When I say worship, I meant the music section. I, for God, forgive me for every time that I have operated without first saying, God, it's only by your grace, it's only by your power, it's only by your spirit that anything's going to get done. God, forgive me for every time I've operated in my own strength and my own understanding because I can't get it done. It's only your love and your passion in me that's going to get it done. And God has his love that he wants to pour out on all of us that compelled him to empty himself for you so that he would compel you to empty yourself for him and his interests. John Somerville was a prominent historian at the University of Florida, and he would always do a thought experiment with his secular students to show them the impact Christianity has had on the world. You know, he, his secular students, they always were just so dismissive of Christianity and kind of arrogant against it. And so he said, he talked about how the values of the Anglo-Saxons and all Northern European tribes were the values associated with the concept of honor. Every culture before Christianity was an honor-shame culture, earning and insisting upon respect from others. And so the values of the Christian monks um, who were transformed by Christ, who went out to convert um, these Anglo-Saxon Northern European tribes, they came with a new value, the value of charity. And so this was the example that John Somerville, this prominent historian at the University of Florida, would always give to his students to show them how much Christianity has impacted them in ways they don't even recognize. He said, imagine you're seeing a little old lady walking down the street at night, and you see her carrying a big purse, and it suddenly occurs to you that you could easily overpower her and take that purse and easily get away with it, but you don't. What would stop you from doing that? 
He said, one, if you were raised in the honor-shame culture before Christianity, the, the reason you wouldn't do this is because you would be scared that if you were found out, you would be looked at as someone unworthy of respect. People would despise me for picking on the weak because that makes me weak. In other words, everything about your thought process would be self-regarding. It would have nothing to do with her and how you would impact her. It would have everything to do with you. How is this going to make me look to other people? How is this going to reflect upon me? That would be the only motivation all about you and your honor and reputation. But then this is where Christianity changed the world, where the mind of Christ, where God himself incarnate changed the way the world thought, starting with his apostles, working out to these monks that also changed the world. You would imagine, rather than what's, what about my honor and reputation, you would begin to imagine how hard it would be to be in her position. What would it be like to be her in that moment? What might happen to the people that are depending on her to provide for them? This other regarding ethic, not this self-regarding ethic, utterly different than the honor-shame culture. And he would always ask his students, how many of you would take the purse? And all of them, of course, would say no. And then he would always say, well, why not? Which train of thought is yours? And virtually all of them would say the second train of thought. Thinking about her position, he says, well, whether you like it or not, that's because of Christianity coming into this world. As Christians, we are called to reflect upon first what God has done in our place that we could not do for ourselves. That God, like a father who sees his children getting enslaved, says, you are not going to be separated from me over my dead body. I am going to take back what is mine. And I, I, I know it's going to cost me everything, but you are worth it, and I am willingly going to lay down my life to get you back. That is who the owner of creation is. And Jesus being so interconnected with us in the corpus he created. When we died spiritually, a part of him died. And he says, I'm going to pay for that with my own blood to get him back. And now, that revelation that is the gift of God from the Holy Spirit, that conviction that God loves me, God died for me, he did for me what I couldn't do, he paid the price for my sins out of gratitude and love for him, you say, God, what can I do for you? Only you could do this for me. What can I do for you? He says, I want you to freely receive this gift, and I want you to strive the rest of your life to freely give that gift to the people around you, to reflect that goodness to the people around you. And I'm not asking you to do anything that I didn't first do for you, and I'm not asking you to do anything that I won't resource you to do. Somebody needs to pay for the sin. It's going to be the, the owner or it's going to be you. Somebody's got to take the fall for your sin. Are you going to pay the price for your sin or are you going to let God pay the price for your sin? Why did Jesus humble himself and come and die? Because he loves you. He's committed to you. And he wants to restore you into his image and likeness. Last two questions I'm going to answer quickly, but I want to close trying to capture the heart a little bit more of what Christ has done through this story of understanding justice needing to be served if God is love. Rachel Denhollander is a Christian lawyer who said this. In every possible scenario in Christian theology, the reality of evil and the need for justice is upheld. Either divine punishment will be meted out on the individual who has done the wrong, or it has to be taken up by God himself, but even perfect divine forgiveness rightly seeks and upholds the need for justice. What is Rachel Den Hollander saying here? She's saying God can't just forgive if he's truly loving without penalty for sin. 
You know why Rachel is unique to be able to speak to that? Because Rachel Denhollander was one of the victims of Larry Nasser, the doctor of USA Gymnastics, who was a serial molester of young gymnasts. She was one of his victims. How would Rachel feel if the judge looked at Nasser and said, you know what, I'm, I'm a God, I'm a judge of, of love and mercy, so I'm just going to let you off. You know, what does the culture say? I, I know this is going to be offensive, but what does the culture say? You know what, what would be consistent with the culture today? Love is love. I mean, who are we to define love? Nasser loved little girls. Love is love. Who, are, who am I to say that's wrong? We're all law unto ourselves. It's all, we get to define love for ourselves. So, you know, who's to say he was wrong? I mean, you know, let's talk about Sam Harris and, and, and atheists today, right? Consciousness is just, it's not real. It seems like it's conscious. It quacks like a duck. It walks like a duck. But it's not a duck! And free will isn't real, even though it feels... Who has more faith? See, that judge, to be a loving judge, to be a good judge, he has to punish the sin. Or he's not good, and he's not loving. But Rachel Denhollander loves Jesus Christ and understands her own sin. And so she framed her testimony against Nasser around a single question. How much is a little girl worth? And she asked the judge and she asked the hearers in that courtroom to ask themselves that question before sentencing Larry Nasser. How much is a little girl worth? What about my rights? What about my definition of love? I was violated in a way that's going to mark me for the rest of my life. How much is that worth, judge? And then she looked at Nasser and said, should you ever reach the point of truly facing what you have done, the guilt will be crushing because you used your power to exploit people unlike God, who used his power to serve people. But Rachel then said, that's what makes the gospel of Christ so sweet, because it extends grace and hope and mercy where none should be found, and it will be there for you. Because there was someone in total power who took responsibility and paid the price. You're going to have to pay it now, but there's hope. Rachel finished saying, I pray you experience the soul-crushing weight of guilt so you may also one day experience true repentance and true forgiveness from God and have eternal life. What is a little girl worth? What's the answer to that question? Every. Every. What? are you worth to God? I want to show you a picture that's hard for us to look at, but it's a picture of what you're worth to God. He was crushed for our iniquity. That's the devastation of the sin. That's a picture of the pain that you and I have caused on other people by trying to play God, for, tr for trying to, to operate out of our own dead, selfish ways, we inflict pain instead of goodness. But he who knew no sin became sin for us that we might know righteousness, goodness, freedom from penalty and power to be reconciled. It hurt God when Nasser sinned, and it hurt God when Rachel sinned, but God said, you're worth everything. I'm going to show it to you. He emptied himself of all of his rights for you. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so very quickly, that leads to the second question. Why should we follow in his example? 
because of gratitude and love. That's why. Perspective on grumbling and complaining, right? If God is that committed to me, if God is that devoted to me, while I'm going to be tempted to grumble and complain when things aren't going that my way, can I not look at the cross of Jesus Christ and go, wow, God, thanks for perspective. Thanks that you are working when I don't see you working. Thank you that you're making a way when I don't see you're making a way. Thank you that I know that even if I don't reach all my goals and ambitions that I have for this life, that God, I can enjoy your love every day with you, your goodness every day with you, that I can represent your goodness to others. And in the end, all that's wrong is going to be made right. There's going to be a new heavens and a new earth because you've taken ownership back of your good creation. And I want to be a part of it. What does Jesus say of you? That you show genuine concern for others' welfare, looking out for others' interests ahead of your own? Or are you just like everybody else, where Christ's sacrifice hasn't quite got a hold of you, where you're not putting on the mind of Christ? You're not reflecting upon the goodness of God in your life to where every time you don't get your way, you're going to grumble, you're going to complain. Why isn't I have my rights? I mean, we do it in the church. Even. I pay a tithe. I should just get it whatever I want. Have you considered other people? I thought we were here for Jesus. We call this the church of the Nazarene. It's his church. I thought we were here to worship him. And I'm not saying that we don't, we're not here to sharpen each other, but what are we sharpening each other in? Performance? Or are we sharpening each other in being like him? Where I want us to get passionate and care is his interest, his interest of becoming Christ-like and his interest of reaching this world for Christ, not what's in it for me and my entertainment purposes. We've got to get our focus back on his mission and his interest. There's a world dying out there. Do we care? Are we putting on the mind of Christ? Are we reflecting on what he's done for us and saying, God, what is the end result of daily? The end result is that we got to be living for his interest, for his glory, considerate of others' welfare, so that when we stand before him one day, we too will be exalted. Well done, good and faithful servant, as opposed to humiliated, in the sense of just making it about me and my glory and what I want and my rights and what's in it for me. Your life is a reflection of who you love most. And I want to call us today. God loves you. He is committed to you. The question is, will you love him and commit yourself to him? Would you empty yourself of your rights? Would you say, Lord Jesus, I surrender my life into your hands. I want to take the time I have left and I want to make the most of it. I want to live for the glory of your name. It's not about me. It's not about my glory. It's not about what's in it for me, God. It's about reflecting your goodness. Jesus will answer that prayer and he will give you meaning and value Say, man, I live for the glory of God. My life means something. Because in every situation, I have an opportunity to bless somebody around me with the goodness I've received. Heavenly Father, (laughs) we are just in awe of you. Jesus, thank you for loving us and committing yourself to us in such a way that you refused to give up on us, that while we were yet enemies, you died for us. That while we were out there trying to play God and do our own thing and live according to our own understanding and the lusts of our flesh, you refused to give up on us. You're committed to saving us to pouring out your Holy Spirit on us. 
And Jesus, I just pray for anybody in this room that doesn't understand that love that you have, that commitment that you have to them to make something of their life, to give them something worth living for outside of themselves, living for the glory of your name, being able to understand that all of our behavior, all of our words, and they're affecting the people around us, whether we like it or not, that we're not just this individualistic world about our rights and what's in it for me, but Lord, what I do affects the people around me. And Jesus, your interest is to show your glory and goodness in your people, to make us your temple, to shine through for this world, to say there's a better way, to not just keep repeating these cycles of violence and objectification of power, but to use the power of God to serve this world out of love for people, out of other centered for people, to take the gifts and the graces you've given us and pour ourselves out in your service. God, forgive us for living for so much less and show us how every single day, how I do in my marriage, how I do, Lord, with my kids, how I do on the job, how I interact with the people around me. It matters. And I can't do it apart from your Holy Spirit. And so, Lord Jesus, would you help us to put on the mind of Christ who willingly, out of love for the Father, emptied himself of his right, his right to get vengeance, his right to hit back, his right to stay in his glorious throne and not die on our behalf. And he gave it all up out of love for us. God, would you let that sink in, that your love might compel us now to be your representatives in this world and to say to people, be reconciled to God. Thank you, Jesus, for your love for us, your commitment to us. Finish the good work you've started in us and through us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.